I just want to say, first of all, that I am not here because I have the plan for what we should do about this moment, but there's some things that I want to talk to you about um, that move to amend. National folks have been talking over and is happening in conversation, you know, in a lot of places, like what do we do? And one of the things that um, move to amend has always been very clear about is that the problem did not begin with Citizens United. And um, these days, I think we also have to remind a lot of people that the problem did not begin and it does not begin and end with Donald Trump either. And so, um, in fact, it didn't begin and end with Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad, which is a Supreme Court case I will get to in a bit. Um, it really starts going all the way back to the founding of the United States and really before that, right, the colonization of the New World, which included what later became the United States, but obviously wasn't limited to just this continent. And, um, but because we're here in the United States, that's, that's kind of wh where I want to just take us back to and be really clear about. We, it is not an accident that we are in the situation that we're in right now. It is not an accident as we're at, in terms of corporate constitutional rights, that corporations, which are property, have more rights than human beings in this country. It's true that there have been some particular Supreme Court cases along the way that have legally expanded corporate corporations and the people who own corporations' ability to get around the law, unlike the rest of us. But the fact is that we ended up in a situation where property has more rights than people because this country has always prioritized private property over human beings from the very beginning. That is what slavery was all about. That is what the colonization and genocide of Native Americans was all about. And so there's a founding violence and doctrine and ideology that our political system holds within it and that our culture holds within it. And um, I think that we can look to just recently and Breonna Taylor's, um, the ruling that came out in that case that uh, the, the damage to the wall and the threat to property on the part of the police officers who shot, not her, but the apartment that she was in is what actually the punishment came down for instead of punishment for ending her life. It's just a, a perfect example of how we have, we have never gotten rid of this issue. And it is, to me, the most fundamental piece of what we are going to need to uproot and then um, destroy in our thinking. And to me also, that is the root of the, the ideology that has brought us to the brink in terms of climate collapse as well, believing that the earth and the animals that we share it with and ourselves as animals too are expendable in comparison to the accumulation of wealth and property and private property and specifically, you know, putting up walls so that people and animals don't have access to resources that we need for survival, whether that's water or or land or what have you. So um, that is, <laughs> that's where I wanna kind of start off and that's also where I wanna end. From my perspective, there are many people who are involved with Move to Amend and we kind of all came to this um, in our own way, but a number of us uh, who started the group were um, originally uh, when we first formed living in Humboldt County, California. I don't know if any of you have been to Humboldt. Feel free to say that in the chat. Um, it's far Northern California. It's on the coast. Um, it has a pretty large, relatively speaking, bay. It's incredibly uh, rural. It's, um, 
it's, it's, it's not what people would normally think of as California when, uh, when you think of California, um, but it is on the ocean. Um, it has six beautiful rivers uh, that flow through the county. Um, and uh, it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. It's also a uh, home to the oldest living beings on our planet, um, redwood trees. So uh, there's just a lot that's really special and important and um, unique about Humboldt County and that area. So uh, the other thing though about Humboldt County is it's pretty divided um, and in a lot of ways, uh, you know, mirroring a lot of the United States. And a lot of that division is over resource extraction. I would say at the core, that's, that's what the, the division um, stems from. And um, so before I moved to Humboldt County, I moved there in 2001 um, after uh, three years of college. And I moved there to work with an organization called Democracy Unlimited, which was one of the founding groups of Move to Amend. Um, and before I lived, before I moved there, uh, Humboldt County underwent a massive and very rapid change as a result of a timber company, Pacific Lumber Corporation was, was kind of, uh, you know, had been around for forever. Um, people had worked for Pacific Lumber, you know, for generations. So, you know, there were people whose grandparents and great grandparents and parents, et cetera, et cetera, um, worked, worked and, um, were uh, timber workers. And uh, Pacific Lumber Corporation was bought in a hostile takeover by a company called Maxam Corporation from Houston, Texas. And Maxam um, bought the company kind of unbeknownst to the people who owned it. Uh, they they kind of naively put it on the public market um, or trading market with the idea that work the workers over time would buy the majority of stocks and come to own the company but that's not how capitalism works you had this totally undervalued company because the thing about pacific lumber is that even though they didn't have really like sustain sustainably certified forestry at the time this is in the um 80s uh they they had an ethic as a company of trying to um you know not they definitely didn't clear cut and they uh, managed the forest that they owned in a way that would ensure that the company's longevity was part of um, you know, the, the plan. And that was so that people could work there uh, for their lifetimes and then you know, their children's lifetimes as well. So it's not like it was all perfect, but it, was, but it wasn't what we think of today as you know, a, a timber company um, in terms of most of our experience if we live in places where they are operating now. So Maxam Corporation um, bought Pacific Lumber in a hostile takeover and then engaged in massive clear cutting and um, also raided the pensions of the employees um, and uh, sidled Pacific Lumber with all of the debt from Max Am, that Maxam had as a result of the other work that they did around um, the owner was involved with um, junk bond trading and um, you know other dubious stuff did this to other companies as well Kaiser Aluminum in Washington State also suffered a similar fate at the hands of Maxam. So in response uh, our community, community in Humboldt, and then also a number of other people from outside of Humboldt County came to um, protect the redwood trees, the old growth redwood trees. And there was a campaign launched, you know, kind of calling people to come do that, um, made up of locals, but then also a number of young people who were, you know, absolutely devastated to hear about what was happening to these trees that, you know, were older than any human beings alive. Um, came. So this is Julia Butterfly Kill. So I remember hearing about her um, when I was in high school. She actually um, sat in this tree uh, from December. Uh, so the tree's name was Luna. They named her uh, the tree. And uh, Julia Butterfly was in the tree for 738 days from December 10th, 1997 to December 18th, uh, 1999. 
So I graduated high school in 1998. So um, I remember hearing about her and being inspired by what the forest defenders were doing in Humboldt County and um, the protection of these trees. She was able to ultimately protect this tree, although the ecosystem was, was still devastated, I have to say, and um, you know, there, the, what was protected was minuscule compared to what was taken. Also at the same time, there was um a, a retaliation on the part of law enforcement and also timber workers and maxam corporation against um the forest defenders um who were occupying trees in humboldt and the area so the pictures on the left are of activists who are actually locked down so they're um attached to each other um blocking uh a timber road to to um, block logging trucks from going in and the sheriffs swabbed pepper spray directly into their eyes. So I know we've seen a tremendous amount of police uh, cruelty and brutality over these last few months right in front of our faces. Um, and, you know, I'm sure many of you know that that's not new. That's not unique to this time. It is obviously something that happens much more um, to black folks and black and brown folks, but um, it also happens to activists. And uh, so in 1997, this was an act performed by the sheriff. It was direct orders from the sheriff. Um, the following year, David Chipsy Chain was an activist who was in a tree that um, was cut down intentionally and he was murdered um, in, in all of it. He was crushed and he died. Um, and so I show you these things and tell you these things to give you a sense of how divided the community was and how the calling it timber wars was not hyperbole. You know, there was violence. In fact, there was death as a result of um, this battle to try and protect uh, Humboldt County's redwood trees. And the reason why is because an outside corporation came in and uh, tried to act as though they were, you know, law enforcement acted on their behalf over the behalf of the public agenda and needs. There was no discussion about what was going to happen to these trees because it was all private and it was Maxam's authority and they could do whatever they wanted and they did. So in response, um, uh, the community organized itself. So first, you know, it was sort of like activists and a lot of environmental work, lawsuits, things like that. And, and actually, on, in terms of in that fight, on the whole, the community lost. You know, most of the old growth redwood trees were cut. Um, some of them were preserved and, um, you know, and it wasn't all for absolutely nothing. But in terms of what the goal was, Maxam won. Um, so we were able to elect a new district attorney. So the district attorney who was um, in office uh, kind of in after, you know, because these activists sued and um, uh, lost, uh, the, the district attorney wouldn't even actually, you know, move the case forward in, to try and, um, in the argument that this was, you know, cruel and inhumane and um, unlawful actions on the part of the sheriff and the deputies. So we elected a new district attorney. And he also, right after he took office, he sued Maxam Corporation for fraud because they would regularly lie on their timber harvest plan so that they could cut more. And then by the time um, the lawsuits would get through the system, they would already have done the cuts and then they would just pay fines and then they would just go, you know, sorry. And the, um, the damage had been done and, you know, it was irreversible. Um, and so that was their that was their routine practice. And so our district, our new district attorney that we organized and we fought very hard to elect um, to kind of change the um, whole demeanor of of the top law enforcement person in our county um, turned around. And within a couple of months of taking office, he sued Pacific Lumber and Maxam Corporation for fraud. Um, that case was actually thrown out, and the argument was. <laughs> interestingly on something related to corporate personhood and corporate constitutional rights because um, Maxam made the argument, well, when we petition the government, which is true for us, we um, are not obligated to uh, tell the truth um, because uh, 
that would be kind of a chilling, that would have a chilling effect if, if, if um, you know, if people felt as though they always had to tell the truth when they got up in front of, say, elected officials and they gave their two minutes in a public meeting, if we were held to telling the truth, then, um, you know, if we misspoke and we could get charged, you know, so that so there has been case law that is established that we do as part of our First Amendment when we're speaking um, politically and petitioning our government, we're, we're actually not necessarily obligated to tell the truth. However, submitting a timber harvest plan is not petitioning the government. That's like saying when I submit my taxes, I'm petitioning the government and I, under my First Amendment, I'm allowed to say whatever I want because it's my First Amendment right. That's obviously not something that people enjoy, but the courts of Humboldt County actually agreed. And so that case was thrown out. So just an example of how we don't actually need, corporations oftentimes don't need to take these cases all the way up to the Supreme Court in order to get their justice. The legal system um, follows in line for them um, all the way down to county courts. But we did get our district attorney, but the other thing that Max Am Corporation did in response was, uh, initiated a recall campaign against our district attorney three months after he had taken office. And I will skip ahead and tell you that we were able to fight that off, but it was the most expensive campaign in the history of our community at that point. And this is a very small community. There's 80,000 voters total. Um, it's, it's, it's not, uh, it was not a place where elections cost a lot of money and they, they poured almost half a million dollars into this campaign to try and unseat our district attorney that we had just elected. And um, it was because he was trying to enforce the law against them. So we basically fought this huge fight to get a new district attorney, and then we had to turn around and put it all back together again and fight another fight. So the organization that I worked with, Democracy Unlimited, um, was involved in that effort. We weren't central to the anti-recall campaign. We were working at the local level um, to educate about corporate personhood and corporate constitutional rights and why when corporations have rights, it makes our ability to exercise self control, um, you know, community control and local control impossible. So this, um, so even though we were able to win, it came at a humongous cost on the part of our community. It meant that there were other races that we couldn't invest in because we had to fight this other one twice. Um, it meant that our community had to put 250,000 of our own dollars into a race to keep somebody in office that we had already just said that we wanted. Um, and it also was, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of volunteer hours. And it was incredibly, um, it was empowering in a way to bring um, the community together, but it also felt like a, a total waste and a futile fight. And this company shouldn't have the power to force us to do this. And so Democracy Unlimited put together a campaign um, that we ran as a proactive ballot initiative that was Measure T. It was called the Humble County Ordinance for Fair Elections and Local Democracy. And what it said is that um, in Humble County, corporations don't have constitutional rights. And so therefore, we are banning any outside company from contributing money to our local elections. Um, and it passed with 55% of the vote in June 2006. And we brought thousands of volunteers into the campaign. We ended up using these little tea bags um, and we talked about how our founding fathers, uh, you know, fought against the East India Company and the, um, you know, English Empire and uh, threw tea into the harbor and we don't need um, to uh, do that again. We need to pass Measure T. Um, we do need to do that again. So it passed with 55% of the vote in June 2006. And um, it was the law for about a year and a half until uh, our community was sued um, by a company that didn't meet our definition of a local company. Um, and so they were banned from contributing money to political elections. And um, they made the argument that it was a violation of their First Amendment rights and their 14th Amendment rights because we were discriminating against one kind of corporation against others. Um, and uh, it was thrown out in federal court. Our county agreed not to enforce it. And then our county had to pay the, the legal fees of um, the company that sued us. Now, we expected 
that that would happen. We actually thought they were going to sue us like immediately. And so that was actually a smart move on their part, kind of to wait for a year and a half because Democracy Unlimited moved on to other campaigns, our community moved on to other campaigns. And so it was kind of hard to put it all back together again. Um, it would have been easier if we had had kind of all the momentum of the win. So that was a smart move on their part. Um, it was an example of why working against corporate constitutional rights at the local level um, ultimately means that your community, unless we have enough communities that are doing it all over at the same time, you're going to be made an example of and you're going to pay for it. And our hope had been and the strategy that we were employing back in 2006 was, you know, this can inspire other communities. And we went to other places and there are a number of local communities that have passed, not exactly the law like we did, but other, other measures against corporate constitutional rights, taking a local issue like we did and helping to the community to see that in order to exercise their sovereignty, corporations can't have constitutional rights and so standing up against it. But unfortunately, most of those communities have been slapped down or if they've been left to stand, what it has meant oftentimes is that the company that's causing harm just goes to the neighbor, a neighboring community that's less well organ, less organized, maybe less resourced and just sets up shop there. And that was part of why we came together um, in 2009 to form Move to Amend. So let's talk a bit about the Constitution and corporate constitutional rights, because there's probably some of you here who have heard of that, but maybe don't know all the ins and outs. So the US Constitution has two entities in it. Um, and uh, it's really all about what the relationship is between those two entities. So we, the people, at least according to the Constitution, are the ones with all the power. And to the extent that government has any power, that's delegated power to use on our behalf. And so in this framework, the people are free and sovereign. We have individual rights that are spelled out um, in the constitution. And then we are also seen as private. And then in contrast, government is subordinate and accountable to the people. Government has collective duties and government is public. I can't keep going, although I will in a minute, to talk about corporations without slamming on the brakes and pointing out that at the founding of this country and then subsequently for all of the time since, the struggle has been for all of the people who were not recognized by those initial framers as human beings to make clear that we are people and that we deserve a place in this constitution. Um, and uh, so is Howard Zinn and Molly Ivins kind of reiterated, both of them talked about how, you know, the history of the United States can be told through the lens of the series of people's movements that had to be amassed in order to make, to assert that they were people too, because the portion of people who are recognized as human beings by those initial framers were only themselves and their friends. And it was less than, it was about 5% of the population, of the adult population of people who lived on this continent were recognized as human beings. And I really think it's important and I really hope that here we are in 2020 and able to not excuse that away and not say, well, you know, that was just the time. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. There, that was a political fight at the founding of this country. It's been a political fight and question ever since. And um, different, you know, the opposing sides in terms of we the people, the real we the people and the small elite minority have at different times you know, we have made gains and they have made gains, but they made a huge gain when they instituted the constitution on their own behalf solely. And it was a, it was a discussion. There was debate about whether there should be slavery and they decided, yes, we're going to keep having slaves. And there was a debate in the discussion whether women were human beings. And they said, no, our wives and our sisters and our mothers are not full human beings. And there was a question of whether native people would actually be treated as human beings or whether they would be treated as animals 
And for the most part, the founders were very clear on that one. And even though some of them spoke with great um, respect in some of their writings about some of the native um, folks like the Iroquois, uh, and when it came to how the United States and the government of those men treated native people, it was always cheating, it was always stealing, it was always lying, all right? So yes, there was a important moment in this country that was about uh, throwing off the idea of a monarchy, but we need to really disrupt the lie that we are told as Americans and that we proclaim to the rest of the world, but most importantly, that we believe here as Americans, that these were some sort of uber enlightened people who, um, who, who we need to follow direction from today uh, at a time where everything about our world is completely different than everything about their world. And thank God a lot of that includes that people have fought and made clear that yes, we the people means all human beings. Um, and that's still a question, obviously, uh, and a debate and, and a fight that's still continuing on. But one thing I just wanna make clear, and if some of you get upset, then I'm sorry, but this like, founding father worship and this idea that we need to be holden to people who owned other human beings and justified that, even if they said lofty words, I'm over it. I'm done with it. We're not doing that anymore. It's just, it doesn't serve us at all. There's no, there's no point to it. And it holds us back in huge ways that are very intentional. And it's part of why this country remains stuck in so many ways around racism and around gender exploitation and around exploiting the environment. So let's move forward. Okay. Let's, let's, we don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but um, I'm not here to worship uh, George Washington, like ever. So let's talk about corporations though, because there was what the interesting thing about even though a tiny fraction of the, the human beings anointed themselves as the real human beings and the rest of us were left to fight, um, fight that and force ourselves, drives our, drive ourselves into this constitution, the interesting thing was that because corporations were the tools that were used by um, the British Empire to actually rule here on this continent, there was a tremendous amount of distrust of corporations on the part of the men who wrote the Constitution. And so for that reason, corporations are not included in the Constitution. And uh, the early corporations, there were corporations at the founding of this country. And the reason why is because similar to the situation that the British monarch found himself in when Portugal and Spain and, um, the, and the Netherlands started their exploits to colonize this newfound world uh, that Columbus tripped himself into, um, the King of England didn't have a lot of resources, unlike some of the other superpowers in Europe. And so he turned to his aristocracy and said, hey, let's get this going. Let's, uh, let's, let's send, you know, let's send ships. Let's mark, you know, let's plant our flag. We need to get in on this. And uh, the aristocracy responded, absolutely not, because of a doctrine that existed in the time called inherited debt. And inherited debt meant that exactly what it sounds like. If you died and you hadn't paid off your debts before you died, then your son would inherit those debts. And if he didn't pay them off, then his son. And of course it was always sons because women were property themselves, chattel property, so they couldn't have debt, they couldn't have property, they couldn't have land, they couldn't have legal rights. Um, and so what the king did is said, well, the good news is I'm the sovereign, so I can just, you know, good point. Uh, this inherited debt is a little bit of a, you know, deterrent for you to like ma amass a fleet and put together your resources because one ship lost at sea, pirates, disease. I mean, we all know what happened to Jamestown, right? It was a tremendously risky endeavor that the king was trying to get his um, cohorts to join with him on um, because of inherited debt. So he said, what we'll do is we'll create a new entity. It'll be called the Crown Corporation and it's not gonna have the debt. Um, it's not gonna have inherited debt. 
Everybody else will still have inherited debt. In fact, we're going to actually ship a bunch of people from here to this new place. We're going to ship felons. And a lot of those people who are in prison are in prison because they can't pay their debts. And we don't, when we're running out of space for what to do with them. Um, and so, you know, inherited debt stuck around, but not for these crown corporations. And so they had limited liability. So fast forward now to the slide that we're looking at here in the United States after throwing off um, the King and East India Company and the corporations that were ruling each of the colonies. And uh, they, had, they found themselves in a similar situation. The federal government didn't have the resources to um, do the project of building this new country by themselves. So they turned to private capital, but they maintained the same relationship that the king had had, where at the end of the day, the sovereign, now we've replaced it with we the people, but only actually asterisk 5%, the uber special people, the white men with property who are Christians, they um, can start corporations and, um, and have property and all of those pieces. Um, but, they're all these companies that they create are going to be accountable to the state governments that are the ones that create them. So that's why corporations are not in the Constitution, because the Constitution and the federal government was really just an, a, a theoretical idea on the part of this group of renegades who were fighting against the biggest colonial power in the world and somehow were able were, were able to pull off a win, but there was no real meaningful oversight that they could actually institute through the federal government. So they made sure that corporations were chartered at the state level and corporate charters had to be approved and they were revocable by state legislatures and governors. Um, Corporations existed for a limited amount of time. They had a defined purpose. They had to benefit the public. Um, and if they didn't have a case for how they benefited the public, these corporations were not created. Uh, and they were pro prohibited from participating in the political process. And there were a whole number of other um, limitations that these early corporations had on them. The Pennsylvania Constitution and every other state had kind of similar language made very clear and tells us very clearly how a corporation was treated at this time. The legislature shall have the power to alter, revoke, or annul any charter of incorporation hereafter conferred by or under any special or general law, whenever in their opinion, it may be injurious to the citizens of the Commonwealth. I don't know how many of you are from California, but imagine a specific gas and electric company that has murdered people through negligence as a result of the fires um, numerous times uh, was actually held to a standard like this that they had in Pennsylvania in 1857. And the list, you know, goes on and on and on. What about fossil fuel corporations that knowingly um, duped us all into uh, lies about how climate change wasn't real and wasn't going to be a problem for the last, for my entire lifetime. What should be what happens to these companies? Well, right now we don't have any leg to stand on because we have gotten rid of all of that for the most part. Corporate charters today are approved by legal clerks for a small fee. There's no, you know, kind of public process involved in creating a corporation, let alone deciding if it's going to get to continue. They exist forever. That's the default, at least. And the purpose isn't defined or limited. In fact, the purpose is to maximize wealth and profit for shareholders. And this is actually um, a, a definition of what a corporation is that comes from case law, comes from a um, Michigan Supreme Court case uh, in 1919. And it still main is what maintains um, the standard for what a corporation can do and is and who they serve. And so that means that built into the DNA now, instead of this idea that a corporation exists to serve the public good and is a tool for bringing together capital when we might need to do a project um, that you know, the public needs, uh, now it is a tool to externalize costs onto most marginalized people and vulnerable communities and maximize profit for a tiny minority. And there's no limit on political participation. So um, how did that happen? This is, this is the fundamental education that Move to Women has been doing to help people understand that this isn't about one bad court case. This isn't about one bad set of people who are the majority of the Supreme Court. 
it's not about one president. This is about the, the whole framework of our legal system. And there are ways that the wealthy elite have been able to further manipulate it. In fact, when we have been able to um, move to drive ourselves into the constitution oftentimes the swing is that they look at that and say how can we use that and the best example is the 14th amendment so the 14th amendment was passed after the civil war so initially the 13th amendment was passed to end slavery except for in the case of um for people who are incarcerated or who are are uh, previously incarcerated so that's a really big asterisk because that creates a huge incentive to make sure that the people that you want to make sure don't have equal protection end up somehow or other in jail and um and then you can take away their equal protection rights and and or oh, and um their uh ability to not be slaves so the 13th amendment was passed to end slavery and um, the 14th Amendment was passed uh, basically in preparation for what was expected to come from the southern states and, and absolutely did of what came to be called Jim Crow, of treating um, Black people, African Americans, well we're talking about men here, right, because women actually didn't have uh, legal rights um, uh, at the time, um, but men who had been enslaved uh, were being discriminated against and being treated differently under the law. So the 14th Amendment was passed to make clear to the Southern states, but uh, everybody, that um, no person uh, can be treated differently under the law. The law has to be applied equally to everyone. And then the 15th Amendment was passed to make clear that you cannot deny someone the ability to vote based on their skin color. So, um, it was very clear what the purpose of it was. And Justice Miller, who was the Supreme Court Justice, says succinctly the main purpose of the last three amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, was the freedom of the African race, the security and perpetuation of that freedom, and their protection from the oppression of the white men who had formerly held them in slavery, the founding fathers. So that was why we passed those three amendments in this country. Um, but immediately, uh, corporations started to make the argument that they were a person and all of those ways that I described to you before the corporations were treated with extra scrutiny and control because they are a tool for amassing capital and they are also a tool that allows the owners to not have full liability for the actions of the corporation. They're separate. They're, the, they're a business entity, which now is how almost all businesses are, but it didn't used to be that way. There were a special case where you would allow the owners to separate and have limited liability from the actions of the company itself. And so the trade-off was that you were more accountable to the public because you got this extra power. And so, companies, com corporate lawyers started to make the argument that the 14th Amendment um, was uh, that all of these laws and, um, and also they were written in, it was written into state constitutions as well. All of that was a violation of the 14th Amendment because corporations were being discriminated against. But the court said in 1877, no, let's be clear here, the 14th Amendment does not apply to you. Um, but only a little bit later, uh, you had this case, which there's a whole interesting book, Tom Hartman's Unequal Protection goes into the detail, which I'm not going to, about Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad and how um, a court clerk is probably who uh, inserted this in, this, this, this likely did not even happen in the case. Um, but in the head notes of the case, once it was written up, there's this piece where it was another example of, of corporate lawyers trying to argue that this tax law that treated corporations differently in Santa Clara, California from other types of business and regular people 
was violating their 14th Amendment right. And supposedly, according to the clerk and what he put in, the Chief Justice said, the court does not wish to hear argument on the question of whether the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which forbids a state to deny any person within its jurisdiction, uh, equal protection of the laws applies to corporations. We are all of the opinion that it does. Um, so a header, a head note is not legally binding. And so there are some people who get kind of excited about that, like, oh, it's a conspiracy. And it, it was probably. And therefore, um, we just need to kind of like point this out to, to, to smarty pants people on the Supreme Court or something. But the reality is that there were subsequent cases that did rule explicitly. And there's no, you know, it, we can't go back on a technicality. Because the point was, this was the robber baron sort of crowning achievement. So you have all these human beings, African Americans, people who had been enslaved, who fought, who fought and then others abolitionists white abolitionists who joined in the fight for the liberation and were able to drive themselves into the constitution and you had the women's movement that was right there as both as part of that movement and also in addition to that movement right behind it saying okay the 14th amendment is denying us or, or i'm sorry the 14th amendment makes clear that these states that deny us the ability to vote because we are women is obviously uh, a violation of the 14th Amendment and our equal protection. And so you had all of these people um, threatening this ruling elite that had maintained control through defining the rest of us as non-humans, um, this wave of movement and, and then we also had a changing of the economic system. So we went from, from a slave system to an industrial capitalist system. And these industrial capitalists who ran the railroads and who were busy um, you know, arguing that the US government should uh, go from sea to sea and give them all sorts of land and displace the people who live there and fight a war with Mexico to steal their resources. They had a huge amount of power and they had a huge amount of investment and the tool that they wanted to use for their e to to continue co to consolidate their economic power was the corporation, but ironically, their forefathers who had set them up to have the resources that they had um, didn't trust corporations because that, that was a different era, and so they had to undo that and they had to fight back against. Uh, these people's movements. And so they took our amendment, which I think is the most important. I mean, I know we love the First Amendment in the United States, but I think the Equal Protection Amendment saying everyone is equal, everyone's going to be treated under the law. I think there's no better amendment than that amendment that we currently have. And they took it away and they used it for themselves. And as a result, uh, the overwhelming majority of cases heard before the court, after the Civil War, around the 14th Amendment were cases that expanded the ability for corporations to use the 14th Amendment, not African Americans. And so I won't read these, I'm sure you've been able to see. Um, so this is why it's like, it's not about one case. Um, so what it means in the 14th Amendment is that, you know, we can't make clear in our communities what kinds of companies, what kinds of businesses are okay based on their behavior, because that is outside of the bounds of our authority. Companies that want to come into our communities, no matter how they behave, no matter what they do, no matter how much they pay, no matter how much they pollute, we have to make room for them because otherwise we're discriminating against corporations. Or if they want to build cell towers that are known to cause you know, sickness, doesn't matter. We don't have that authority. Uh, I want to underscore how uh, women, like I said, tried to use the 14th Amendment um, in a case, Minor v. Hepperset, where women went to the polls and they voted and they were arrested. And they said, you didn't have a right to arrest us because we, um, the 14th Amendment should make these laws that states all have that deny us the ability to vote. Those are all unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment. And the Supreme Court in 1874 said really explicitly, 14th Amendment doesn't apply to you. Um, the 14th Amendment is only for African Americans. But then in Plessy v. Ferguson, they took it away from African Americans. And the whole point of the 14th Amendment was to make Jim Crow not happen 
but the Supreme Court said, well, as long as the accommodations are equal, if they're separate. And they were never equal and everyone knew they weren't equal. The whole point of them was to not be equal. The point of them was to cause an apartheid situation for black people in the South and the Supreme Court facilitated that, taking the 14th Amendment away from the people who we passed it for. And then they went on from there to secure the Fourth Amendment. So uh, corporations can claim immunity against searches and seizures of their books, records, and other property. It used to be that all of that was available, if not to the public, and in many states it was just the public, but at least to our elected officials on our behalf. One of the dissenters in the minority on that case said, in my opinion, a corporation, an artificial being, invisible, intangible, and existing only in contemplation of law, cannot claim the immunity given by the Fourth Amendment, for it is not a part of the people within the meaning of that amendment. But he was in the minority. And then we have further expanding that with additional cases that came afterwards. So what that means is we don't know what corporations are putting in their, pro in their products oftentimes because they're able to hide and say, well, this is our private property. These are trade secrets. And so, you know, if they are acting in a way that is irresponsible in terms of, you know, BP and the way that they're, um, the safety measures that they have um, in place, inadequate. And so we have, as a result, a huge disaster where people die and the entire gulf is polluted. Well, that's just the way that things are and the cost of doing business. And um, at, the, at the root of that thought is this idea that corporations are private instead of public responsible to us because we're the ones who brought them into existence in the first place. Corporations, there's nothing natural about a corporation. They are a creature of the law and so therefore we should hold them accountable and knowing that they are, you know, amassing, a concentrating um, wealth and resources and we're giving them a, a, a leg up in being able to do that means that that comes with a responsibility but that's out the window if they're, they have a right to privacy. In, um, they've also been able to claim a Fifth Amendment right. They have been able to argue that the Fifth Amendment, which says the government cannot take your property without compensating you for it, companies going all the way back to the 1920s have been able to twist that logic to say that when communities pass environmental regulations, that's a takings of their property. What's the property? Their right to future profit. And so what is the remedy? They must be paid for the profits that they would have made if those laws hadn't been passed. What that means is that communities are then unable because they cannot financially afford to protect themselves. So what we see here is in Pennsylvania where coal companies were digging underneath towns and people's homes and collapsing people's homes and entire towns in on themselves. And so Pennsylvania passed a law to prohibit that, to curb the, the, the greed of digging even when structures are over them for all of the coal that they could possibly find. And the coal industry sued Pennsylvania and said, okay, Sure, but you have to pay us for the money that we would have made if you hadn't passed that law. And what that means now is that local governments don't even pass the laws because their attorneys um, advise them that that's a lawsuit waiting to happen. And what that means is they will have to pay because of the precedent. And so, you know, when that's so often why, you know, local activists will be banging their heads against the wall trying to argue with their local elected officials, but their local elected officials oftentimes, even if they would like to protect their community, their hands are tied legally. Um, so that's that case, another dissenting opinion, restriction imposed to public, to protect the public health, safety, or uh, mo morals from dangers threatened is not a taking. The property so restricted remains in the possession of its owner. The state merely prevents the owner from making a use which interferes with paramount rights of the public. But again, because private property is more important to our justice system than, than human rights or than collective common rights, that's, that doesn't matter. This is of course logical, but that's not what the majority of the court would find. So this isn't about the Roberts court. This isn't about, um, you know, whatever nightmare of a court we're going to have next, because this, this goes way back and this is how it has been, you know, since for generations. 
it's built in, it's baked into the American legal system. Um, so the First Amendment uh, was a huge coup on the part of the corporate elite when they were able to secure it, um, going back to the 1970s. So in first, the court ruled that political spending is considered protected speech, meaning that spending money in elections is protected by the First Amendment. What that means in effect, I mean, we all know the effect that that has, right? It means that if you have more money, then you have more of a right to influence the political system. And that is exactly how it is. And that was before Citizens United. Um, and then subsequently, they made clear that, yes, that applies to both rich people and corporations. So corporate spending for influencing or affecting voters' opinions um, is protected speech. It used to be that in state, you know, states banned corporations from contributing money both to political elections, but also to ballot initiatives. And in the um, Bilotti decision, the court said that's on the constitutional. States don't have that authority. And then in 1996, they expanded it outside, of, you know, went beyond the idea of money in politics to um, corporations have negative speech rights. They have a right not to speak. So Vermont passes a law requiring labeling, not even banning the, pro the ingredient, but labeling, requiring labeling of bovine growth hormone. And the dairy industry sues Vermont and says, we have a right not to speak under the First Amendment, you can't force us to speak. And this um, precedent has been used in numerous cases where states have tried to pass laws requiring disclosure of what's in products that people are buying, the latest one being Monsanto's Roundup. And um, Monsanto uh, is making the argument that California doesn't have authority to require them to say that Roundup causes cancer. They're both saying cancer, Roundup doesn't cause cancer, but if it does, we're not required to say that it does. You didn't have authority to pass a law that tells every single company that puts cancer-causing products in um, ingredients in their products uh, because of our right not to speak. What about our right to know? What about our right to hear? What about the property owner's rights not to have their homes collapse? You know, every step of the way, uh, regular people's rights are trumped by the rights of giant corporations. And then Citizens United, we probably all know about that, um, overturn McCain-Feingold basically saying that independent expenditures, um, political um, action committees, corporations, and the wealthy, you can't limit how much money can be raised in, in political action committees and their ability to influence elections. And then we have two other cases that expanded even further. The McCutcheon versus FEC is not a corporate related case. This is about the extreme wealthy. Um, so they limited or they got rid of the aggregate limits that individuals used to have on them for making donations to political campaigns. They also said that the government's only interest in corruption is, is literally quid pro quo election, uh, um, corruption. So like if I show up with a money bag and I say, I'll give you this if you pass this law, that, that's illegal. But if I set up a super PAC and I send as a company and I send a lobbyist to elected official XYZ and I say, you know, we have this uh, law that we'd like to see passed or not passed. And uh, I have a political action committee with $10 million that's just looking for where we're gonna spend it in the next election. What are you gonna do? That's not corruption. Um, and then uh, the Hobby Lobby decision expanded uh, the rights of the First Amendment rights to freedom of, to include freedom of religion. Um, to closely held for-profit corporations. Uh, so saying that basically the company will have the same, the, the owners can make the argument that a company has the same religious beliefs as um, the owners, even though there might be numerous people employed by that company that hold different religious beliefs, that doesn't matter. So the impact is that everything we hear Everything that's, you know, that happens in political campaigns is a result of, of who has the most money, 
Um, and we don't even know at this point because of the, you know, the dirty money, the hidden money, the black money, the dark money, dark money, that's what it's called, um, where the, um, where it's coming from. And we don't have a right to know that. And so our political system, which never was really working all that well on behalf of regular people in my lifetime. But at this point, you know, there's no contest. So the results of these Supreme Court decisions time after time again, is that corporate interests are weighed as, as a, the priority over the general welfare. And the pattern is that large corporations can afford to assert their rights better than small companies or regular people. And this allows them to minimize regulation or avoid it entirely. Um, it uh, means that wealth and power are used to slow or halt enforcement of the law. And then also any law that we enact in court or can be challenged in court. So, you know, California just passed a law yesterday um, banning 24 of the most toxic chemicals in, um, that are put in beauty products and personal care products, the so stuff that we're putting on our bodies, stuff that we're putting on children's bodies. And we'll see whether the beauty industry is willing to abide by that law or whether they come up with some argument that it violates um, their rights in some way. Well, and another law was passed requiring transparency around uh, fragrance, which is in so many products and is considered right now a trade secret, so it's hidden. And there are literally thousands of chemicals that could be included under fragrance that are toxic. And um, California passed a law requiring the disclosure of those uh, ingredients now, and we'll see whether um, the industry allows that to stand or whether they decide that that's a violation of their First Amendment right not to speak, for example. So it means that democracy is off the table. It's unavailable to us. So in response, we formed Move to Amend, and our amendment, the We the People Amendment, says that the rights protected by the constitutions are the uh, constitution singular are the rights of natural persons only artificial entities like corporations limited liability companies and other entities shall have no rights under this constitution and are subject to regulation by the people number two federal state and local government shall regulate limit or prohibit camp or prohibit contributions and expenditures, and the judiciary shall not construe the spending of money to influence elections to be speech under the First Amendment, and makes clear that the intent, that this can't be used to abridge freedom of the press. 